We'll get started. I want to welcome you all to our annual afternoon of conversation and start by thanking the Oracle Brass Quintet for launching us and for Alan Fletcher to lend us this facility. Every year this afternoon marks the end of the first half of the Aspen Ideas Festival and the open of the second half of the Aspen Ideas Festival. I'd like to extend a very warm thank you to all the pass holders who supported us for the last three days. I hope you had a wonderful time. We certainly did. Thank you very much. And to those of you that are about to start, we welcome you. Uh, we've had a robust week. In the next few days, you're going to learn a lot about world affairs, arts and culture, design and sustainability, the arts, but also have some very intriguing conversations about the next economy, global health, a, a, a new subject for us, uh, the topic of play, which I think will be both fun and very interesting. And finally, uh, a dedicated series of conversations on Latin America, um, and we will have a major session on Saturday afternoon with nine former presidents of Latin American regions uh, following a big reception there and Ballet Folklorico from the Aspen Santa Fe Ballet. So I think you're really in for a treat for the next several days. Uh, we'll get to everything over the course of this afternoon. We have a very big afternoon. I would only suggest we're not going to take major breaks between sessions. If you find the time that you need to leave, I ask you to do it quietly, uh, and we'll keep going. We'll have short breaks between sessions, um, but you can take breaks, and we expect people to come and go as they need to. And without further ado, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce you our CEO and President, Walter Isaacson, and the head of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Bill Gates. Thank you very much, Kitty Boone. It's always a pleasure to be at the Ideas Festival because Kitty does all the work and I get to sit up here. Thanks to Kitty, please. And to David Bradley, our partner in all of this of the Atlantic. David Bradley, thank you very much. Welcome, Bill, to Aspen. It's nice to have you here for the first time. Bill Gates. So this festival started with some pretty downbeat uh, talks from Neil Ferguson and others. I'm going to ask you to uplift us a bit, as if you were the preachers we sometimes have in this revival tent. Tell us what you're optimistic about. Well, I'm optimistic about most things. Uh, if, if you avoid getting close to U.S. politics, that, that helps you be more uh, optimistic. If you look at the last 50 years, what's happened in the world in terms of uh, health, education, uh, women's rights, almost any metric uh, you can pick, in fact, every metric that goes to, into what's called the Human Development Index, there have been unbelievable improvement. One of my favorites is the under five uh, childhood death number, which back in 1960, over 20 million children died. Uh, now, the number of uh, kids in that group because of in increased population is up about 40%, uh, but the number who died is under 8 million. So you have uh, almost a factor of three reduction in the rate of death, and vaccinations explain about yeah. two-thirds of that. Uh, so, you know, it, we can look and see things that kind of scare us, but, you know, take literacy in Africa, 1960 about 10%, today about 50%. Um, we're making progress. It's, it's tough in many areas. It sometimes feels like it won't happen. But uh, whether it's advances in medical sciences, advances in information technology, uh, advances in uh, uh, energy type systems, there's a lot to be optimistic about if you, if you look at it the right way. What about education in the United States? Is that going in the right direction? No. Uh, it's, that's a very tough problem. 
Uh, since 1970, a lot of resources were put into the system. That is, uh, teacher salaries, uh, particularly because of a very generous pension piece, uh, were increased to be well above the average. They were below the average, they were increased to be well above the average, and the number of adults was more than doubled. So that is, the adult-student ratio was uh, increased by a factor of two. Does that mean the teacher-student ratio was increased? No, a lot of those that knew headcount, some went into the classroom. That is, average class size today is lower than it was back then. But a lot of it went into uh, special needs uh, education where you have judicially mandated, very uh, resource intensive activities. Some of it went into counselors, some of it went into security guards. There's often arguments about which parts of that are, have merit and which parts of it don't. It is one when you take charter schools, they get a much, much higher percentage of their adults in the classroom teaching than uh, compared to typical schools. What can we do to improve K-12 education in America the best? Well, today, if, if you're motivated to learn, if you really, really, really want to learn, uh, this is a, an amazing time for everyone because if you have access to uh, Wikipedia, if you have access to the latest information on the web, there's a, new, a website that uh, I've just been using with my kids recently called Khan Academy, K-H-A-N, just one guy doing some unbelievable 15-minute tutorials. There's great college lectures out on academicearth.org. So if you're motivated, now you can go to the very best lectures. The average quality of the lecture on Academic Earth is greater than any individual university because it brings together 50 different universities and it brings together the best teachers, the best MIT teachers who uh, the video was acquired through OpenCourseWare, the best at Stanford, the best at Berkeley. And it's, it's just a phenomenal thing. And then you can get online you know, talk to other people about what you agree with, what you're confused about. You can uh, hire a tutor who will generally come from India for about $28 an hour, straighten you out on any of your uh, scientific misunderstandings. So the learning empowerment at one level is showing the potential that every student will be able to go up and assess their skills, understand, okay, what part of math am I confused in? So there's, a, there's great promise if we use technology well, but more importantly is to take the very best practices, take the great teachers and the great environments for teaching that have been created and learn what's there and spread that out uh, to the rest of the system. There's a very small part of the system, which is high performance charter schools, that prove that for less than what we spend on average uh, for students in the public school system, that you can get over 90% of the kids to go to a four-year college, you know, have incredible learning in any metric you want. Creativity, they can add, they can subtract. Uh, by every metric, it's an, a phenomenal uh, experience. And the, the most deprived inner city kids are the ones that uh, it, it's aimed at and it works well for. Should we have competition in education so that uh, there'd be charter schools competing with the school monopoly? Yeah, I'm a big believer in charter, but even a huge, I keynoted the National Charter Association meeting, which was a, a couple weeks ago in Chicago. Charter today, high performance charter at 2%, the best you could imagine over a 15 year period is going up to be about 10%. And so you're gonna have uh, almost 90% of the students in public schools. And so you have to believe that changing the personnel system, uh, using online technology, and spreading best practices from charter into those schools, that's where you get the dramatic change. And so yes, we should keep growing charters. We have to shut, there's some load performing charters that need to be shut down, which actually messes up the overall statistics from the charter movement. Uh, we need, to, people like KIPP though, should grow as fast as they can. They have 88 now, they'll have 105 next year. So that they are doing very good work there. But the heart and soul of this issue is going to be about how teachers are encouraged to improve, uh, how they're told what they're good at, given uh, positive feedback for helping other teachers learn to do what they do well. That's the, the, the management challenge, the personnel 
challenge of taking great teachers and having, having more of them. That's the, the big win. You're about to address the American Federation of Teachers, which is one of the two big unions, probably the more reform-oriented of the two big unions. Uh, between us, we won't tell anybody, what are you going to say to them? Well, yeah, the, the American Federation of Teachers, uh, which is uh, the president is Randy Weingarten, has reached out and gotten involved in a number of these reform efforts. So our foundation has four districts where both the district and the union has agreed to really measure the teachers and give them feedback and where they're short in terms of keeping the classroom calm or helping the student who's behind or helping the one that's ahead, really have ways that it, you pick the dimension that they, uh, someone else is better at and you give them a way of, of transferring that knowledge. So in the four districts, the uh, two of those are AFT districts, and so I'll praise the union leader who took the part of the contract that said you have to notify somebody weeks in advance. If you're going to come into the classroom, you can only be in the classroom a certain period of time. And now we're changing that to saying, hey, there's a webcam in there that's taking all video, and if you have a part where you think you didn't do a good job, you just remember what time that was, show it to another teacher, get some advice. If you think you did something particularly well, show that to another teacher, and that should go into a library of best practices. So teachers all over the country are looking at uh, teaching various concepts or dealing with various problems, and they'll see who's the best and, and learn from it. So it's, it requires a pretty radical change to say that the, the uh, evaluation system is not going to be capricious and high overhead. What you have by default in America is an evaluation system where all you have to know is how many years have you been in the job and do you have a master's degree and then you know the salary. There's no other factor that has to do with how well your kids are doing and the data shows that the, the top quartile of teachers gives you about two years of learning in a year and the bottom quartile gives you close to zero years of learning in a year. So the variance is mind-blowing. I mean, it's, it's like a factor of 50 difference between the very best and the, the not the best in terms of how much learning. Well, I'm sorry, why don't we get rid of the worst? Um, there are, once you really evaluate people and give them a chance to improve, uh, all personnel systems um, that are in most areas do include that if you've been given enough chances, it might not be a profession that's a match for you. We tend not to emphasize that because the big win isn't the 5 or 10% who may not belong there. The big win is taking and transferring for the people who really do belong there but have a few things they're not doing as well. Uh, that's where you get the improved achievement, not so much the, the piece about the bottom. But the piece about the bottom is there. That's part of a natural personnel system that, that you would have some of that with appropriate safeguards. In your campus tour, you talked about uh, this past year to college students about doing something in life that really matters. How do you get more young people into believing that teaching, for example, is a noble profession, other things? Well, certainly we're in a period right now where the demand by even the most the students with the greatest opportunities to go into Teach for America, which is the only real clear path for them if they're not going to get a teacher certificate, the demand exceeds the number of positions. And so it was stunning to see that, you know, at Harvard, at Yale, at all these top schools, you had somewhere between 10 and 18 percent of the class applying for Teach for America, and often about one out of four of those, uh, there was enough capacity to let them in. To compound that, not only is it a finite number, but in many states over the next two years, there are going to be a significant number of teacher layoffs, uh, anywhere up to about 6% of the teacher workforce will be laid off in some states. The way the rules work, it's not based on uh, who the best teacher is, it's based on who has the most seniority. And so you'll have a lot of young teachers who come in not just TFA, but young teachers in general put more time into the classroom and, and by year three they're getting uh, better results on average than the veteran uh, teacher is who's vesting in 
in. So it's, you have big variance there. And, and so this fiscal situation is going to make things a lot tougher. Uh, and uh, some people who went into the profession are going to find themselves, at least temporarily, uh, not, not having a job there. Overwhelmingly, we need more young people and very talented young people to go into teaching. Part of the reason the U.S. had better teaching in the past was because of the deep injustice that women didn't have equal opportunity. And so you got very talented women going into teaching. Well, now it's far, far better that they get to pick any profession, and most professions they're now the majority of. Very few left that, that's, not, that's not the case in. But it means that teaching actually has to get serious about identifying best practices and spreading those around. You can't rely as much on natural talent as, as you did in the past. How can technology help us with teacher assessment? Well, the, in, in an area like math, the most straightforward assessment is to take the math scores of the kids coming in and the math scores of the kids going out and say, did they improve? And we can correlate that with other metrics. If you go to the students and you just ask them two questions, does your teacher use class time well? And when you're confused, does your teacher help you out? If you ask those two questions, you get a result that correlates perfectly to the test results. And the students know who the good teachers are. It's different than who they like. There's a lot of the good teachers they don't like. But they're not kidding about what's going to happen when you go into that room, whether anything interesting, if the class is going to be calmed down, if you're not paying attention, if the teacher will notice they're not paying attention. And that, when you visit a charter school that I encourage everyone to do, that's what you see that's just so phenomenal, is the teachers really tracking everybody in the room. And it's not that they're small class sizes. There's 30 to 35 people in that room. They've learned a technique, which is not a natural thing. Uh, you know, the, the, the book, uh, Work Hard, Be Nice, about uh, Dan Levin, Mike Feinberg, talks about how they had to learn how to be great teachers. There wasn't anything that showed them, and they found some exemplars and took different pieces of what they'd done. Well, now the high-performance charters are doing that in a, a systematic way. They're bringing the teachers in. They do team teaching with huge numbers of students and, and make that work. So it can, it can be done. We also take the webcam results. We take... Uh, we survey the parents, we survey the other teachers. All of these uh, indicators line up. And so for reading, math, you've got very strong data that are constant. And we think the teachers who are involved in these things will be willing to tell the other teachers, hey, this was not high overhead. It worked well. It helped me identify where I needed to improve. Yes, a few teachers may not have uh, measured up to this, but you know, we care about educating the kids. So, so this is a good system. That's the goal. If we don't get the teachers out of the four districts evangelizing this measurement system, which does use webcams and electronic surveys and things like that, but if we don't get them evangelizing it, then we're had because you can't change this without bringing teachers as a whole along and being a, a majority being enthusiastic about what you're up to. Do you worry about the criticisms of teaching to the test, or is your assessment systems that you're advocating more sophisticated than that? Or should we, in my opinion, teach to the test? People should learn to read and do math. Well, 80% of the things that are called teaching to the test are actually just fine. Yeah. There are very extreme things where you'll learn about how multiple choice is done a funny way. So you can get really, really narrow stuff that's teaching to the test. But to be honest, it's hard to be creative if you can't add and subtract. It's hard right. to be creative if you can't read a complex sentence and understand what it means. And so, yes, that's not the only thing that counts. But the, you know, if you go into those charter schools and you look at how they're encouraging kids to do projects and how they're work, learning to work together, you won't see any misalignment of, okay, here's a class that's creative, but they can't add, and here's a class that can add, but they're not creative. If the class is engaged, there's a certain culture of connecting with that teacher, they will learn how to add, and they will learn how to do projects together. Mm -hmm. Why do we still have textbooks, and when are we going to get rid of them? <laughs> well, textbooks are, <laughs> textbooks in the U.S. are particularly maligned because what's happened is they've been designed by committee, and the incentive is to change them because the textbook guys don't like competing with the used textbooks. And the person on the committee 
who wants to add something thinks, you know, we don't teach arctangent enough, or we don't teach pi graphs enough. And so the textbooks just keep getting bigger and bigger. An American math textbook is three times larger than an Asian textbook. And we reteach concepts many, many times poorly as opposed to teaching a modest number of concepts a few times. And it's, it's stunning that there'd be this systemic difference. We have 50 states, but they all fell into this trap of committee-based, uh, committee-designed textbooks, and the Asians did not fall into that trap. And so there's this common curriculum you sometimes hear about. There will be textbooks for that that'll be online and free. You still have a problem. You can't assume everyone has an electronic device. You know, our foundation was involved in putting personal computers into every library, but even that, uh, it, that's not perfect universal access. In the next three or four years, some evolution of the netbook or iPad or phone will be adequate for engaging in that textbook in an interactive way. And, and the price will come down enough that you can do that for well less than you spent buying the textbooks, and yet what you get is a lot better than that. Beyond the textbooks, you need self-assessment. You know, the one key thing in math is that people progress at different speeds, and people need to be reinforced of, okay, you got this piece, you can move on. And, or if you get further up and you're doing story problems, you need diagnosis that says, look, <laughs> the reason you're messing this up is not because of any of this story problem. You just keep taking two minuses and, and getting a negative number, uh, or you know, long division, or, or turning an improper fraction into an integer and a fraction, you, you, you've got that messed up. And so self-assessment software is a big part of this, where any student can sit down and try things out. And that is happening, whether it's stuff that we're funding, race to the top, money is funding. The contrast to what happens today, where you graduate from high school and then you take, when you go to community college, you take this test that the majority of minority students fail, you get stuck in remedial math, and the majority of the people get stuck there, never get a degree. So they've wasted money, they've been humiliated, they've spent a lot of time, and they get, get nothing out of it. That's because it's completely opaque. You aren't told which part is wrong. The test is this black box that neither you or your teacher uh, knew about afterwards and you, and you didn't know about beforehand. Our view is you should be able to go online, spend 15 minutes, and know exactly what result you're going to get and know which areas you need to go and, and work on, and everybody should have free access to that. What are you funding at the Gage Foundation in elementary and secondary education that you're particularly excited about now? Well, most of it falls into this teacher measurement uh, and improvement activity, mm -hmm. and that's a very big, big project. Have fun explaining that to the AFT one more time, yeah. Well, the AFT isn't monolithic. You know, it, it, yeah. it, there's a lot of teachers and every teacher there wants to teach well. And if they teach well, they want the student in the next grade that they put so much energy into to continue to have a good educational experience. And when you contrast that to, yes, you know, maybe in terms of what they want in pensions or job protection or things like that, things have, uh, you know, that's been overemphasized. It's not like we have some magic measurement system that they know about and they know is good and they're rejecting that. Mm -hmm. The status quo is very attractive. Uh, the system works, you know what your salary is going to be. If you stick around long enough, you, you're paid very, very well because the pension is so much more generous than it is in, in other sectors of the economy. It's understandable that getting, getting people to take a risk and do these new things they're going to be conservative about that. And particularly at a time when these state budgets are so messed up, and the way that money is allocated to various things within education is not, not very rational um, today. That. Well, the, it, as you cut s s budgets, at the time you actually cut them, you can't renegotiate the pension thing. You can't go back yeah. and say, okay, the special needs thing, you know, maybe we need community tuna. Those things are untouchable. And so what you can touch is are things like the length of the school year. Hawaii cut had the one of the shortest school years in the in the nation, and this nation has the shortest school year of any uh, country, even the Asian countries and the rich countries. And we're going in the wrong direction. The good charters uh, 
almost uniformly have long school day. You know, the extreme is the boarding school where you have that sort of 24-hour uh, environment that well, you're creating. Well, should school days be till 6 or 7 p.m. and school years be 11 months? You don't have to go that far. To uh, KIPP is, uh, the school day uh, is about an uh, eight and a half hour day and they go every other Saturday and they go three weeks in the summer. And of course the teachers are working longer hours because they make themselves uniformly available mm -hmm. to the students after hours. So it's a very, the commitment of those teachers and their equivalent in non-charter schools because a lot, a lot of those people in that top quartile are not only naturals, but the energy and devotion they're putting in is pretty phenomenal as well. And one thing, you imagine that if you raise the average up, they would feel more rewarded and maybe even uh, feel, feel better and do even more of that. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> uh, do you think that you talked about this pension that's very generous for teachers, and it kind of kicks in not right away, but after 15 years or something. And then you talked about state budgets. Do we have a huge unaccounted for pension overhang problem that's going to hurt our budgets? Absolutely. It's, it's pretty mind-blowing. The book, there was a book written about it about eight years ago called While America Slept. Uh, and America's continuing to sleep. It's partly because the way that state budgets are presented is so fraudulent. There's a thing called the Government Accounting Standards Board that allows you not to take uh, full pension costs, not to take retired health care benefits. So whenever something's free, it gets overused. And so improving the pensions of the people already retired never shows up on the state budget. Ma letting people retire early, have more overtime factored into their retirement thing. All these things come from the fact that the, when the person who says yes to those things, the government person, it doesn't feel any pain at all because there's no number that ever shows up. So we need a lot more transparency about this, which will be bad news and uh, at a time when state budgets are already very bad. And then maybe we'll be more rational about it. I mean, it's like when stock options were free uh, and people were saying, oh, we would use them even if they cost uh, a lot because they're so magical. No, in fact, when the true cost was accounted for, they were still used, but they were used about a fifth as much as they were before they were in this accounting limbo that they looked free. And now pension payments to government employees, lots of that look free. And we've, we've messed up long enough that we have a huge overhang here. It also, you get some imbalance between the people who don't vest in and do vest in because the how big that discontinuity is. But in terms of a big overall economic issue, didn't we get a wake-up call from Greece and, for that matter, California and Illinois now? And isn't there something radical we're going to have to do to get these numbers aligned? No, we didn't get a wake-up call. Uh, the wake-up call, unfortunately, there's only two types of wake-up calls. One is a society that has a lot of centrist politicians who are very intelligent, who are looking at these long-term trade-offs and involving people in those discussions. That's one way that you do this stuff. The other is called the bond vigilantes. Uh, when your debt rates spike up and they're acting like, hey, there's some doubt you're going to repay your debt. Why was Clinton able to balance the budget in the 90s? Well, medical costs weren't as out of control as they were. Uh, some of these pension things hadn't come along. You didn't have the Reagan ta tax cuts, but you did have the bond rates saying, hey, action should be taken here. And people said, okay, maybe we need to do something. For a variety of macroeconomic factors, the U.S. Treasury rates are super, super low today. So it looks really free to continue federal deficit spending and state deficit spending, which is nominally a balanced budget, but only accounting fraud allows you to pretend it's, bu it's balanced. There's 49 states having their constitution, other than everybody but Vermont, has to balance their budget. And so no, the Greek thing did not cause good information to be put together. I mean, tell me what, the, what the, the projection for the California budget five years from now is. They're not required to do it. Um, it there's just nothing that forces these type of analysis, and so you don't get these discussions. And you look at how many levers does a governor have to pull when all of a sudden he gets the news, his, his, his 
budgets out of balance. You know, Schwarzenegger tried to lay off prison guards. The court wouldn't let him do that. He tried, to, he tried all sorts of things that are really inefficient. And it's the same thing for school districts. When they want to cut their budget, they cut certain programs. They'll, they'll cut um, uh, buying software, not, not the kind of software Microsoft does, but educational software. They'll cut uh, some good overtime programs. They'll cut things that are very effective because you've gotten to a point where you can't trade anything else off. Local governments will shut parks that saves tiny amounts of money. They'll reduce. And so we need like and about the trade we spend on what does the tax will look like. And if you ever happen. Your tools that are left are really very inefficient, very poor. Uh, you're, you're, in, you're in trouble. But you, current, our current course on speed will get us to that point sometime in the next decade. The overall structure of that conversation would have to be how do you allocate resources in a sense of That's what way. government's all about, yep. Talk about Let's do some allocation of resources. The proportion of GDP that goes to health care, is that over-allocated? Uh, well, the U.S. spends 17% of GDP on health care, and you drop down to number two, which is uh, Switzerland, at 12%. And so you say, well, that, hey, what do we get for that? Well, uh, we, do, we get nothing. Uh, the health outcomes, uh, which are complicated to to compare, but the health outcomes are basically slightly worse, both in terms of averages and the inequity. The, our bottom quartile is very ugly compared to all other rich countries' bottom quartile. Our upper quartile is somewhat better, but that's how you get the, the inequity. So we're spending at a huge rate, which if it wasn't increasing faster than inflation, it's increasing as a percentage of the economy then, okay, you can probably afford it. But as it continues to grow, it squeezes, unless people say, yes, I would like to be taxed a lot more. Uh, and most states have these super majorities that are required to do that. And, you know, it's not likely, and it's not clearly a, a good thing either. But unless, so if, as, as long as you're dealing with a finite amount, as the medical cost goes up, and that shows up both in state budgets as so-called state Medicaid spending, uh, and it shows up in the federal budget as, as Medicare, and they're part of, of Medicaid. It squeezes out everything else. Uh, so right now what you see is it's squeezing higher education. You're raising tuitions at the University of California at the, as rapidly as they can, and so the access that used to be available to the middle class or whatever is just rapidly going away. That's a trade-off society is making because of very, very high medical costs, and a lack of willingness to say, you know, is spending a million dollars on that last three months of life for that patient, would it be better not to lay off the, those 10 teachers and to make that trade up in medical costs? But that's called the death panel, uh, and you're not supposed to have that discussion. So you, of course, well, we're that's making- That's an interesting thing you just said, which is just the last three months in life for one person or something, because we haven't had a discussion of how to allocate that money, it means we lay off three teachers to do so. I mean, in other words, we That's haven't right. had Society's this type of allocation. Making, we're making that trade-off because of huge medical costs that are not examined to see which ones actually have no benefit whatsoever. Well, wait, and because of pension generosity, we will be laying off over 100,000 teachers, which, you know, I'm very much against that. Uh, and the whole AFT will agree with me on that. Uh, how would you, I mean, what is it that causes us to spend 17% of GDP and Switzerland to spend 12? What's the differential? Yeah, I've read a bunch of books on that. It's complicated. I have a bunch of experts to come educate me. It's a variety of things. Um, you know, last year of life, we're not particularly good at. Um, diabetes is a huge problem in this society that it is not, because of obesity, which it is not as much in some of those other societies. One of the things that jumps out, and I'm not 
don't claim to be an expert on this, and I'm, I'm trying to learn enough to understand what would cause innovation to reduce this, what has been an inexorable rise. How do you get innovation on your side to reduce those costs, which I think can be done. But one statistic that jumps out is we have three times as many specialists as we have general practitioners. And no one else's system has anything like that. That is unique to the United States, and it's because it's a rigged market. That is, the reimbursement rates have been set, uh, the pattern set by the government through Medicare, and you were, it was a rational decision to become a specialist. But what that means is if you're a patient, you have lots of doctors who are coming in and doing little pieces of things, whereas in Germany, which is the best, their one-to-one -one ratio, uh, specialist to GP, that GP is having to do a lot and really manage your care. So both in terms of quality and cost, it's a, it's a much superior system. And it's hard. Would, would, would we get there better if we move from a fee-for-service system to a health maintenance system? Abs absolutely. If you look at what effectively the other countries are doing that gets the incentives aligned properly, it's effectively you have somebody who's got the, it has to look at the long-term cost of somebody's um, sickness. And so they're incented to invest up front in uh, preventative care and the relationship with that patient. And there's not some artificial thing where the sicker your patient is, the more money you, you, you make. I mean, in Medicare, if you can get your asthmatics to have acute episodes, you get rich. Uh, mm -hmm. and if you teach them how to take their medicine and how to do the right things, you, you go to the poorhouse. Right. So it's, it's an odd sort of system that we've designed. Now, if you're in an HMO like a Kaiser Permanente, it's the opposite. And so you say, well, let's look at the data on asthmatics that are in that HMO versus who are, are not. And you see exactly what you'd expect, a very dramatic difference. But forcing people into an HMO I'm told is, is politically very difficult. But that would be a huge mode change in terms of the incentive system. You know, maybe not a doable one. But if there's any clear lesson from the European systems, it's having that alignment of interests. Speaking of allocation of society's resources, I think you said it on your campus tour, at least at Harvard, that the allocation of IQ points of our society to Wall Street financial instruments was higher than it needed to be and that some of those IQ points should go into other fields. Yeah, well, if you say, okay, what portion of society's IQ goes into studying great teachers and documenting what those great teachers do and how you would spread those practices? You know, what is effectively the R&D component in education? It's about as close to nil as you, you can imagine, and yet, What's the most important thing in terms of having a society that has both got equality of opportunity and is competitive with other countries? It's education. And so it's, it's this mind-blowing misallocation. You know, my favorite vignette is that guy, uh, Salman Khan. He was a hedge fund guy uh, making lots of money, and he quit to do these little web videos. And so we have moved, I'd say, about 160 IQ points from the hedge fund category into the uh, uh, teaching uh, many, many people in a leveraged way category. So, you know, that was a, that was a good day, uh, the day that his wife let him quit his job. Uh, now, we need something like that, you know, in a very broad and dramatic way to learn about education, money we spend on education. When you go to a state and say, do you understand that your books are fraudulent? They, you, first, you'll meet with the politician, and they'll say, well, here's the career bureaucrat. Meet with them. They don't know any numbers. And then you'll say, come on, doesn't anyone here around know some numbers? So there'll be some 22-year-old who's being paid like 40000 a year, went to a great community college, and he has a copy of Excel, and he's sitting there trying to figure out the state budget. So, and, you know, he's been told, we have to cut $500 million in the next month. And so he's saying, well, what about this at-home care thing? Maybe I'll just zero that one out. So the IQ that's devoted to these complex government trade-off things is ridiculous. I mean, <clears throat> you know, if you gave me three years to cut 
the California budget as much as it needs to be cut. I'm not sure how well I do, but you know, at least you might draw on some people who know the domain and really look at what's going on, and, and you'd notify people. If you were going to get rid of something, you know, they'd have three years' notice that, okay, the amount we spent on some category is going to go down, and you can, you can prepare for that. So it's, it's a really, the closer you get to it, the, the, the more you think, wow, <laughs> how has it worked so well for so long? Uh, because it has. <laughs> You and John Doerr, I think, and some others have uh, been now involved in energy, energy technology, and trying to reduce carbon, both through technology and maybe putting a price on carbon. Tell us about that. Well, energy is this super important and interesting thing in the economy. If you can bring the cost of energy down, it improves everything. It improves the cost of food, the cost of transport, the cost of water. Everything has got a gigantic energy component. So if you look at the progress of civilization, it is about low-cost energy. That's the shift from human muscle mass and animal muscle mass to engines. So you know, first you start with coal, then you have oil, you have natural gas. So the, it's another industry. It's not as extreme as education. It's another industry where the investment in R&D is very low. Now we're trying in our energy economy both to reduce the cost and to put a constraint on it, which is zero CO2 emission, not, you know, 50% less or even 60% less. Effectively, we have to get to zero. And so the fact that we don't encourage market innovation by having either the, the carbon tax or the regulations to do that, and we don't have the government funding the basic research to give us the highest chance of making these breakthroughs, it you know, it feels like a mistake. And in this case, it's a global problem. It's not uh, the U.S. versus China or anything like that. This, you know, the warming problem is, is uh, global. In fact, the irony of it is that the huge negative effects will be in the mm -hmm. tropical zones. Those of us in the temperate zones, the actual increased, increased CO2 will probably improve uh, agriculture output to some degree. We don't really know. It's, it's within the level of uncertainty of whether it'll only be uh, slightly good to, to somewhat bad. In the tropical zones, it, it's going to be bad. It's just a question of how bad. The, the people who live there were the poorest, didn't cause the CO2 problem, and yet they're the ones who are going to suffer from it. You know, this is a time where foreign aid is being cut as all these budgets are, are being brought down. So the fact that we're not working on behalf of the poor to create, innovate, and fund the R&D for cheaper energy and CO2 free is, is kind of disappointing. So John and I and some others said that, uh, that the R&D should be up by about 11 billion a year, which would take it up to 16 billion, which would be about 1.5% of the amount spent on energy in, in, in the U.S. Um, so we, you know, we went to Washington, D.C., and. Uh, met with senators and the president, and uh, we had a nice binder for our report. Well, no, who knows? Who knows? Actually, I, I shouldn't be cynical. I don't know if it will have any effect. Uh, I think the R&D provisions of any energy bill will probably be much, much better. The, the so-called House bill had been, uh, the extra money had been frittered off into various very specific technologies and other things. So hopefully we'll get something better than that. That looked like it was headed towards. A lot of what happens will happen in the private sector. Tell me about what you're doing with Nathan Mirvold or Vinod Kosla and some of these pretty awesomely smart people. Well, one, one great thing that has happened is that the, there has been more uh, capital and IQ put into energy innovation in the last mm, six or seven years than was true before that. Uh, Vinod Kolso was among the first to you know, really get there. Uh, John Doerr and his group is now uh, focused on that. A lot of so-called Silicon Valley, and I use that term very broadly, that type of risk taking is looking at neat, neat energy things. And there are inventors all over the world, including a lot in the US, but a lot in, in other countries as well. This is wonderful. There are regulatory things 
uh, and some basic science things having to do with materials that are also have to be done. So you can't just count on, on uh, the innovation. A good example of that is this uh, nuclear company that Nathan and I have put time and money into called TerraPower, which has a whole different type of nuclear energy that uh, avoids some of the problems of the existing nuclear energy. And you need somebody who's willing to build a novel reactor. And the U.S. is not exactly the place where that decision would necessarily be made quickly or would be made in the affirmative. So we're, we've got this design, which is brilliant people, I guess uh, so far all, all based in the U.S., who are going around talking to various countries about would they build one of these things. And if it, you know, on paper this thing is a miracle, it, of course it emits zero CO2 and the electricity is cheaper than uh, coal-based electricity. Okay, how does it work? Oh, it, it's, when we burn uranium today, uranium has two different isotopes, one called U-235 that's 0.7 percent of the uranium. So it's a tiny little piece and you have to do what's called enrichment to build that piece up. That's very expensive and then you burn that and then you get a bunch of ugly waste. Right. What we do is we take all the uranium, including the 99.3 percent, and we have this a type of reactor that can burn that. And we never open it up, and we never move it around, and we don't, you know, it sits there while the radioactive decay goes away. So the economics, essentially the fuel is free, and you avoid the waste uh, problem. We can even burn the waste from those other guys. So it's enough of a different reaction that the cost to build it is a lot lower. Now the problem is that it's new, and anything involving nuclear that's new People are appropriately cautious, and so uh, there's a few science questions, like are there so many neutrons flying around that it messes the thing up? We don't think so, but, but there'll, uh, there'll be a tiny bit of risk until we actually build it. Anyway, I'd say it's one of about a thousand, if we had a thousand ideas like TerraPower, mm -hmm. at least five of them would work. Uh, and so what we need is an environment where you know that the regulatory environment, you know, say you have a breakthrough in carbon capture, is the government willing to sequester what's a million times more than the nuclear waste underground for the long term? Very dangerous, very scary, tricky thing. Why should you invent something that helps with that if you don't know if the government's really interested in, in supporting it? And in fact, what happened with nuclear waste where they agreed to do a particular thing and yuck them out and then they changed their mind doesn't set a very good precedent because that amount of waste is minuscule. I mean, absolutely tiny compared to anything about so-called carbon sequestration. You know, from the 1870s to the 1890s, we were very innovative and risk-taking in the age of invention there. And that happened, too, at the end of the 20th century. And you just keep saying we've become a little bit less uh, driving towards risk-taking, driving towards innovation. What can we do to keep ourselves an innovative and risk-taking society? Well, there is a natural cycle in societies. Uh, you know, what the U.S did in the 1940s and 50s is unbelievable. The engineering projects were incredible. What Japan did for steel making, ship building, factory quality in the, the 70s and the first part of the 80s was unbelievable. That same sort of fervor of we have to take risks to move ahead, it exists in China today and the world benefits immensely. Those Chinese advances, that cheap steel, the, the ingenuity, the quality of manufacturing, that was a wonderful gift to the world. There are industries like really breakthrough energy things, biology things, software-related IT things, where the U.S. is by far the leader, by far. You know, we manage, and, and even, you know, even if we don't do things right, it takes a long time for that to erode away. If you want to erode it away, you would raise tuition at the University of California, so we're, we're on track. One for one. You would, um, you would mess up immigration where high IQ people, what's the most important import into the United States? IQ. You know, this country, smart people from all over the world have wanted to come work here. And companies like Intel, Google, Microsoft, Apple, you know, that is part, uh, you know, 15% so, you know, of, of what you get is you get these bright people and you're creating jobs around them and, you know, paying lots of taxes, it's, it's a great thing. So, the, if you want to stay strong, it's your basic education, it's your university system, it's your basic research, uh, it's immigration. There are things like that that will maintain our relative strength. 
the U.S. in the next 20 years is going to invent wonderful new medicines. These trend lines, you know, are there you, a little bit you have to say, what is your goal? If your goal is the U.S. relative to everyone else, you don't care how many people are dying of Alzheimer's or anything, then 1946 is your year. Uh, and everything has been downhill since then, you know. We had Europe in this war-torn state. China was in this incredible famine. And we really dominated everything. And, heck, we're only 5% of the population. It's amazing. You know, we spend over half the defense spending in the entire world is spent by this 5%. Now, is that impressive? Maybe. Uh, maybe not. Uh, you know, medical expense. Some of it's spent well, some of it's spent poorly. So we have huge advantages that we can renew. I'm not trying to paint a negative picture at all, but China's relative position, India's relative position, 5% of the world will not dominate innovation to quite the degree that it does today. And that's fine. You know, if somebody invents an Alzheimer's pill in China and, you know, one of us here gets to take that, you know, that's fine. I'll say, oh, made in China, okay, I'll take it. Uh, <laughs> innovation, you know, if somebody invents a way you can get energy with no CO2 emission, and you know, we're not going to overheat the planet, it's okay. Uh, you know, we should use that technology even if it was done on an international basis. So living standards are going to get better. The place they will be the best for the foreseeable future will be this country. The intelligence about some of these trade-offs and the fact that the status quo feels good enough, the status quo in terms of education, sometimes act people, it's not, but they, the data is not shoved into their face like the way this Waiting for Superman movie tries to shove it in their face. We are more content with the status quo. And it means that, you know, we can end up arguing about things that aren't really about the key long-term future things and not addressing some of the things that are. And if you get too close to that, you think, wow, uh, you know, I wish some of those things were better. But it's, it's a very positive picture. You know, you talk about China perhaps being the next engine of innovation and for Alzheimer's pills or whatever. You were in a discussion last night, I think it was with uh, Jim Steinberg, the Deputy Secretary of State, on the question of whether China's restriction on the free flow of ideas, information, speech, and its restrictions of freedom would constrain China. You talk about China perhaps being the next engine of innovation and for Alzheimer's pills or whatever. You were in a discussion last night, I think it was with uh, Jim Steinberg, the Deputy Secretary of State, on the question of whether China's restriction on the free flow of ideas, information, speech, and its restrictions of freedom would constrain China from being as innovative as the United States. The, any of those constraints on political speech are, are bad, but they are not Anybody who thinks that's holding China back in a significant way in terms of scientific innovation is wrong. They, in terms of the dialogue at universities and how they collaborate and various things, that is not holding them back. And so they will innovate. They represent 20% of the global population. And they are on their way uh, to using 20% of the world's energy and having 20% of the world's ideas and having 20% of the world's military budget. I mean, it's outrageous that they should do this. Uh, but they're sort of carrying their weight more and more in terms of everything good and everything bad. They are, uh, you know, their energy usage is still a quarter per person of what it is in the United States. But they've got more people, so they managed to actually get ahead of us. They're actually not ahead of us if you count the stuff they make for us. So we're still the biggest CO2 emitter in terms of all the nice little gadgets we use and everything. But if you bill them for our gadgets, then they just passed us uh, in terms of, of CO2 emission. Anyway, it's, it's a complex picture, but the, their innovation is, is full speed ahead. And so much the better as long as we're also uh, doing, renewing the things that have kept us so far ahead. And you cannot say in China will be the the engine of innovation in the next 20 years. U.S. universities were built up over 50 years, and they are amazing and quite unique. And anything we do will only, will only erode that in the second 10 years of the 20-year period. So the U.S. will be the engine of innovation, uh, per, not, not completely, but in a, uh, a high percentage sense in biotech, IT, software, 
uh, even the physical science things that, that underlie what we need in terms of some of these energy breakthroughs. One question about your world of Microsoft, old world. Um, are we moving away after 30 years from a desktop and PC-based information environment to one that's mobile or based on social networks in which the PC will be left behind? Well, the term PC, if you view it as a very static thing on the desktop, then it was left behind when we got portable PCs. Uh, if you view it as something that has a keyboard, then as we get the pen and voices input, then we'll leave it behind. So it's, it's partly a matter of terminology. When I'm browsing the web on my TV and I'm using the same software and standards and graphics that were used uh, out of the PC revolution, is that a PC or not a PC? I don't, I don't care so much about the term. The software magic that lets you find information, analyze information, uh, all that that came out of the PC revolution has moved on to the phone, which is a great thing. And you know, what's the boundary between a phone and a PC? Well, there's going to be all these devices in the middle that defy easy categorization because as screen technologies, you can roll it out in various ways, unfold it, it, it really is going to create wonderful new devices. And almost every surface will be a screen type device. And almost anywhere you go, between having a camera and voice input, you'll be interacting with that device. There'll still be pens. Pens, I think, will surprise people in terms of the tablet form factor. There'll be... In other words, you'll have, instead of like an iPad, a pen-based input device for a tablet PC, a tablet yeah, device. Yeah, we've had it. It's not been mainstream. So I'm predicting, once again, it's arrival into the mainstream. Uh, you predicted this before. Absolutely. And, <laughs> and, you know, I'll either be right some year or I'll be dead some year. Uh, uh, but you say there's not that much of a distinction between, a, say, a phone and a PC. One distinction is that the PC tends to be based on the openness of the web and searching information like that, whereas mobile devices may be based more on apps that are a little bit more self-contained. Does that change things? Well, apps on the PC are, are self-contained. Uh, there's lots of great apps on the PC. There's lots of great apps on the phone. You have all sorts of things that are somewhat orthogonal. You have phone versus PC. You have software that runs on multiple manufacturers' hardware like Android or Windows Mobile versus software that only runs on one hardware so software kind of like iPhone. You have many different things that are competing in the marketplace. And it's a very healthy environment because you've got some people who believe in the pen, some people who don't. Some people who believe in voice, some people who don't. Clearly, you know, dedicated devices like a dedicated music device or a dedicated mapping device or a dedicated uh, remote control device, they will seed over time to a general device. And so if you can have an LCD that's as thin as a Kindle and has good battery life, if it gives you browsing movies color, and you know, therefore you can edit documents, comment documents, take notes, things like that, that will be better. In the hardware horizon of the next even six years, we are going to get devices that will really call into question whether you want any specialized devices at all. If I can take a phone and roll the screen out to be 12 inches, yes, I'll still have the intelligent whiteboard, I'll still have the TV in the home, but the, the current categorization, the only way it really stays around is, is talking about distance, holding it here, having it out here and having it further away. That, there are some user paradigm things about the distance and the size of things and the techniques of interaction that even though it can be based literally on one code base, one hardware architecture, you're going to have to have some adaptation for screen size and screen distance. Let me end by asking you to explain what you call you and Warren Buffett and John and others your challenge. Yeah, the philanthropy in the United States is greater than in any other country. And so, sort of in the spirit of saying, okay, take a strength and uh, renew it, you know, push it to new heights, Warren Buffett and I uh, and Melinda got together and had several dinners with people of significant worth who were doing philanthropy and talked about why were they doing it, what did they learn, what did they like. And those dinners were amazing. And in fact, in the dinners it came up, uh, gosh, maybe other people should hear how we made it fun, how we avoided 
some bad things, how it can have some huge impact, is, and be as fulfilling as whatever activity created the wealth. And so we decided to create this thing called the Giving Pledge. Uh, we've called a few people up, and we've had a very good response rate. John Dorr and many other people have uh, signed up to, uh, to that. And Anne. Uh, and Anne, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of a family decision. You know, it's, it's like, you know, your kids realize for the first time at least half your money's not going to them, uh, which might be good for them. Uh, I said that to somebody who was on the phone. He said his son was six months old. I said, uh, okay, uh, I didn't, that, that didn't convince him. But um, it, so, you know, we hope it's a group that will grow in size. Right now, the largest states in the U.S. give 15% uh, to charity. And, you know, we think there's room for that to be more. If people knew how much fun it was, what the impact was, they would both think about it at a younger age and use some of their talents towards it. They would involve some of their high talent associates in, in doing the work. And they, they would probably be drawn into to giving more. And that's a, a wonderful thing. We're going to do the same thing uh, with some people in India where the expectation for people of high wealth, it's not as established, uh, and so it kind of hangs in the balance. And likewise in China, we've got some people signed up to do a, uh, it'll be more next year, but to do a giving pledge equivalent there. So it's something we're trying, and every time we do these events, you know, I learn something about giving. I hear unbelievable stories about what, what people have done and how it's, it's touched them. So for everyone involved in the thing, it's kind of a fun thing. This is not kind of a guilt trip thing. Now, being called, calling somebody up and having them say no, I'm not good at that, but I'm getting better uh, <laughs> at it. Not many have said no. Uh, Bill, thank you very much, and All thank right. you for what you do.